to learn about the Mishkan, before we jump in, make sure that you have opened up bit.ly backslash Mishkan Prezi Notes. It's going to look something like this. And it's going to walk you through the main things that you need to know, uh, and you can take notes as you go along to make sure you're capturing the most important information. Okay, so everybody's got Mishkan Prezi notes ready to go, and we're going to start. You can pause it if you need a second to get it ready, and continue when you're ready to go on. Okay, so the Mishkan, sometimes translated in English to tabernacle, but nobody really knows what tabernacle means. When was the last time you talked about a tabernacle? happens to mean a small building, but it's not that useful to know in English. It's more useful to know what the root is in Hebrew. So in the word mishkan is sh, shen, ch, chet, and nun, n, sh, ch, na, meaning dwell. Who's going to dwell in the mishkan? The shechina, sometimes referred to as the presence of God, sometimes referred to as the feminine aspect of God, dwells in the mishkan. Okay, so here's a picture that an artist made representing the artist's vision of what the Mishkan um, would look like. Now, there's a few things about it that are not um, accurate according to the text. And when I say the text, I'm talking about um, sections from the Torah that we're going to be looking at. Um, the roof, the artist has drawn with a peak like this. That's not going to be accurate. We'll see later on that it's going to have a flat roof. But otherwise, we're doing pretty good here. You get a sense of how big it is relative to people. And you get a sense of what it looks, where it's laid out. You got the whole camp of Israel all around, millions of people surrounding it um, in the desert. You also notice that it's got this cloud floating above it. That cloud, um, the text refers to, um, you know, appearing up above the Mishkan, and uh, that would be the visualization of God's Shechina. That's kind of God's presence taking its place at the Mishkan, not to be confused with this, which is just smoke. So this is normal smoke, and this is like God smoke, God's presence. Here's what it looks like from overhead. This is the tent that you just saw, and here's the courtyard on the outside. And you'll notice from the courtyard that you have a couple of things um, outside the courtyard. You have this brass laver. A laver is basically a, a washing, a wash bucket. Those of you who know some Spanish... Um, might recognize that word. So the laver is a wash basin. And then there's an altar. By the way, notice how you spell altar. A-L-T-A-R, not E-R. There's, uh, there's a brass altar outside. Everything outside is made out of what? You got it, brass. It's like the least valuable metal. Whereas on the inside, stuff is going to be made out of gold. So here's the inside of the, um, of the Mishkan. And it's divided into two sections. This section, which is called the Holy and this section, which is called the Holy of Holy. This is the Kodesh, and this is the Kodesh Kodeshim. And inside it, you have, inside the Holy, you have three things. A table, which we'll look at more closely. And if you're facing inside, the table is on your right. A menorah on your left, and a golden altar right in the middle. Then you have this curtain here, and on the other side of the curtain is going to be the Ark of the Covenant. Now you get a better view Facing in, on your left, the menorah, on your right, the table, straight ahead, the golden altar, curtain, and the Ark of the Covenant. Here's an overhead view. Here's the um, courtyard around the Mishkan. Here's that brass altar, the brass laver, and then here's the Mishkan itself with everything gold inside. And you'll see that each, this artist has imagined, has visualized, as the text says, each tribe of Israel, um, organized by tribe, um, kind of like the points of a clock in a way, uh, surrounding the most important thing, which is the Mishkan. And the most important thing in the Mishkan is the Ark of the Covenant. So there it is, the final view, just to make sure that it's in your head. And that's the structure of the Mishkan. Now let's talk about the furniture and the features of the Mishkan. So the first thing is that uh, the most important um, item in it is the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, it's really, in some ways, the center of the universe uh, while the Israelites are kind of making their way through the desert and until Jerusalem comes along. This is really where it's at. Um, maybe even when Jerusalem comes along. It's a symbol of law, and it's a symbol of covenant, and it's also got memory and connection 
because inside it are the Ten Commandments. And, of course, the Ten Commandments symbolize the connection between God and Israel. You also have the connection of these two angels called Kruvim face-to-face on the Ark. And the text will say later on that God is going to connect to the human realm. He's actually going to speak to the to humanity. It says, from between the Kruvim on top of the Ark. So just imagine God's like presence emanating out and speaking to humanity. So this is like the point where God enters this universe. Awesome. So what's inside it? We have, oops, sorry. We have inside it the broken tablets of the of the of the covenant. You know, remember when Brosha, Moshe broke them? You have the second um, version of it, the whole tablets. You also have manna. Remember the manna when the people were complaining about not having bread and the God was like, here, here's some bread. It's manna. Some of that they're going to store in the ark. And, and also Aaron's staff of leadership. Aaron has a staff that uh, he uses when he's in positions of authority and that will also go in the ark. Okay, what did you do with the Mishkan? What's it for? So the first uh, main purpose is, like, what you what you would do in the Mishkan is you would offer korbanot. Um, in English, we would say sacrifices, but then you lose some of the meaning of it. The shoresh of korban, korbanot, is kuv kuf resh um, vet, and that means close, karov, close. So korbanot, why is it called that? Because korbanot bring God and Israel close together. Uh, Israel shows its thanks when they have um, food that they are thankful for. They show their they show their appreciation that the yummers came from God, uh, and a little is sort of offered back to its source, and you uh, grow closer to God by showing that appreciation. Okay, and here it is written out, korban. Okay, now this copper altar that's going to be outside the mishkan. Um, all the korbanot, meaning animals, would be burned on this um, altar. Um, animals and some other stuff, too. We'll see that in a second. But notice it's copper. Remember, copper is the less valuable metal, less valuable on the outside. Gold is valuable. Put that on the inside. So copper altar outside the Mishkan. Plus, you're going to be burning stuff on it. Who wants to have lots of burning meat and stuff inside a building? Maybe you do, but the Israelites didn't. So that's going to be outside. So what was offered on the Copper altar, a bunch of different korbanot. For example, actual animals. Like, we have a barbecue today. They had God barbecues back then. So people would bring offerings, and they would take parts of it. And you can see here, there's a priest, and he's offering up parts of the um, the meat on this altar. By the way, the whole animal was not burned whole. Parts of it were burned, and then parts of it were eaten by the priests. And if you brought an offering, you got to t- take some uh, too. So, like, everybody's having a barbecue together. The priests, you, and God. What else? Um, something called libation offerings. So, we got water, and we got wine. Um, you can f- imagine for a moment a very important Jewish tradition that involves wine, right? Kiddush. And in some ways, the, the oldest origin of that is using it for libations. Next, not a rabbit, they were not burned on the altar, but pancakes. Yes, pancakes were actually burned on the altar, along with, um, if you didn't have the money to afford a larger animal, you could bring a pigeon, because they're smaller and cheaper, and you could afford it. So why make it impossible for people to follow the tradition? Make everybody able to, by allowing you to bring a pigeon, and um, just a reminder that sacrifices were eaten by priests and by the people bringing the offering. Here you have some priests, they're bringing, got a couple of sheep, and this weird-looking bread called lechem panim, which we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, all that stuff is burned on the copper altar, and that copper altar is located outside the Mishkan. Inside, on the golden altar, was offered something called incense. So remember, you're burning food and Animal parts outside, a uh, lot of smoke, don't want that indoors, but, you know, you might burn a stick of incense in a yoga room or something, so that's how you remember that the incense, golden altar, is inside. Um, and here's what it looked like. It's about the size of a person, as you can see. It has two poles for carrying. Here's a picture of the high priest, and he's offering some incense, and some smoke is going up. 
And you can see that the incense altar is by the curtain, separating the Kodesh from the Kodeshim. This curtain is called a parochet, which incidentally, um, in a synagogue, the curtain that, sep that goes in front of the Torah in the Ark is also called a parochet, um, kind of as a remembrance to that. And the menorah is on the left, and the table is on the right. That's always how it is as you're facing in. And inside, on the other side of the parochet, is the Kodesh Kodeshim and the Ark with the angels sitting on it. And only one day a year did the priest go inside the Kodesh Kodeshim, and certainly they would light this incense first and fill this whole area with smoke, almost like a protection against God's incredible power. Um, fill it with smoke and the priest would go inside just on Yom Kippur. Okay, now that's a, that's the, that was the golden altar as opposed to the copper altar. Okay, the other thing to know about is something called face bread. In Hebrew, they call it um, lechem panim. In, in English, sometimes it's translated as show bread, but then you lose the idea of panim. Panim means face. You might know from Yiddish, panim, or maybe your grandparents say, oh, you have such a shayna punim. Panim, panim means face. Um, and so it was a table. The table looked maybe something a little like this, and on the table would be uh, stacked the bread. Now, this picture, the table looks pretty accurate. This, I'm not so sh convinced based on the text. It doesn't exactly sound right, and the and Jewish tradition doesn't quite have it that way. Um, <clears throat> our tradition is it looks more like this with these shelves on it. Whether it's shelves or whether it's one, it's not really that important, but it's a golden table is the main thing to know. Um, oops, I'm going to run it back. And remember that it does have these poles, just like the golden altar head poles. And on it would be special face bread. So to help you remember, here's bread with a face. So Jewish tradition says that the face bread did not um, either look like a pancake, which is why it's called face bread, because it like a pancake has two faces to it, you know, two sides of it. But we have another tradition that says that the face bread was shaped like this. Um, weird, bizarre shape. Um, but a way to remember that is the bread actually has two faces, kind of like the ends of the bread are sort of face to face. And this painting shows uh, uh, maybe more clearly what that face bread might look like with that weird curved shape with the two ends looking face to face. And here are here's a picture over here of the priests eating the face bread after it sat in the Mishkan for however long it sat. And here is the face bread as a diagram. So we're going to stop there. You've learned enough about the um, purposes of the Mishkan for now. And we're going to continue on with the motifs later.